رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues, this lecture is a new one about the brain anatomy by CT and MRI since the previous one contains some of the uh, uh, facts that are no longer uh, uh, valid in the clinical practice and also I uh, will add some of the uh, uh, new techniques that are now considered essential in the protocol of imaging of the brain especially by MRI then as you all know that uh, uh, we do not usually need some uh, preparation for patients are, who are going to have a CT scan of the brain especially uh, those are, who are scanned for emergency causes but sometimes we need the patient to fast for about uh, six hours if he is an adult or four hours if he is in the pediatric age group uh, if we are going to uh, give the patient contrast material or if we want to sedate him so that uh, uh, the scan is not disturbed by the patient's movement. Uh, the contrast material usually injected in the CT scan is the ordinary one which is used for intravenous urography like urographene and the telebrex and the dose is in the range of 1 to 2 milliliter per kilogram body weight. And in uh, 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 some children and the uncooperative patients we may need some sedation and this also requires uh, fasting for this period. Actually uh, in the previous days we uh, used to separate the patients into two categories. The category who are going to uh, perform the exam without the need for contrast injection and those who are uh, injected by contrast uh, at the start of the examination. But uh, nowadays we the trend is or the right way is to uh, scan all the patients way before injection of contrast material then the one who is responsible for this session or these examinations the radiologist will decide if the patient needs to be injected with contrast material or he is uh, uh, the, the exam is quite uh, satisfactory without the need for contrast injection. Actually we need to inject contrast whenever we are suspecting infection or neoplasms and some of the other uh, conditions you may uh, you are actually know. Then in order to uh, scan the patient by CT the patient lies on the CT machine in the subine position and we should have a scanogram in the lateral view and uh, uh, using this scanogram uh, as a scout to design or to align the sections we are going to have in the brain we usually have the sections starting from the skull base going upward till the vertex and we usually align the scanning a plane to the orbitometer line and this line is the reference line in any of the uh, radiographic examination of the skull and also in the examinations of the uh, uh, brain by CT scan. The scan intervals are usually uh, taken at 10 millimeter slices for adults 7 mm for children and 5 mm for infants. Then after finishing the scan we have uh, the sections starting from the skull base going up until you reach the vertex of the, of the skull. 
and in the brain protocol we used to have the sagittal T1 the axial T1 axial T2 and axial flare but nowadays one of the important parts of the uh, protocol of brain examination is to have the diffusion weighted images and the ADC map. Then the protocol of the MRI of the brain will include the sagittal T1, axial T1, axial T2, axial flare, axial diffusion weighted images and axial ADC map then uh, the patient is scanned in the supine position we use the sagittal images as a localizer to design the the sections and we usually uh, start from the level of the foramen magnum and we proceed to the vertex of the skull horizontally there is no angle for the examination and you know that we are able to have this angle but an MRI we do not usually need this angle then the slice thickness is 5 millimeter we may leave 2 millimeter inter slice gap and we may not leave this gap but usually we have the slice thickness is 5 millimeter and we uh, leave 2 millimeter inter slice gap if we uh, look if you look at this uh, lines and you can see that we proceed from the level of the foramen magnum going up through the brain at a time you will uh, cut the cerebellum and the posterior to the cerebellum you will cut part of the occipital lobe and this is very important to know as an anatomic fact since uh, in the exams or in the clinical practice you may be confronted by a lesion in this particular area and you may think that this lesion is in the cerebellum but actually it is in the occipital lobe then you can easily appreciate and differentiate between the uh, parenchyma of the cerebellum and the occipital lobe considering the presence of these well uh, demonstrated cortical uh, sulci this may happen also in the CT scan but you are not able to differentiate the cerebellum from the occipital lobe in the CT scan and we assume that all the structures present in the posterior fossa belong to the uh, cerebellum and the brainstem of course then uh, uh, what is the flare images these are uh, T2 weighted images with fluid attenuation meaning that it is uh, a T2 sequence with suppression of the signal of the water in the T2 weighted image you have bright signal from the CSF but in the flare image you have the CSF of black signal and this suppression enabled you to see this particular lesion adjacent to the ventricle which can be easily missed in the T2 weighted images since the lesion in the T2 is bright and also it will be bright in the flare since the flare is a T2 uh, image but uh, because of the brightness of the CSF in the T2 you cannot differentiate the lesion from the ventricle and this is a valuable image now and is essential in the imaging protocol of the brain then if you look here and this is t1 and this is t2 and you may be uh, you may not see any lesion but if you look in the flare image and you can appreciate that this is a lesion and uh, here you see another one and the third one and the fourth one multiple lesions that are not seen in the t1 nor in the t2 weighted images since the flare because of the fluid attenuation and its t2 effect will augment the visualization of such lesions then one of the values of the flare also is to differentiate between old and recent infarcts old infarction is almost similar to water 
then water will appear black in the flare image but the recent infarction will appear of low signal in the t1 and the high signal in the t2 and also high signal in the flare because this is actually a t2 weighted image and this where the, there are a lot of values of the flare weighted images and this is just to uh, uh, to know the uh, some of the values then uh, considering the anatomy we start by the level of the posterior fossa and we have the fourth ventricle as an anatomic landmark then if you look to the sagittal image by mri you see the fourth ventricle and the cerebellum is posterior to it the brain stem is anterior to it and the brain stem is composed of three parts the bones which is the biggest part the medulla oblongata and the midbrain then if you have a section at this level and you are cutting in the fourth ventricle then anterior to the fourth ventricle will be the brain stem but if you look carefully to the fourth ventricle you can again see that the fourth ventricle is large in its middle part and it is smaller in its inferior part and also smaller in its superior part and when the fourth ventricle is large the largest part of the brain stem will be in front of it and this is the bones then this is the fourth ventricle which is large then this is the bones which lies anterior to the fourth ventricle and of course you know that this is the basilar artery which lies along the anterior aspect of the brain stem and anterior to the bones and the basilar artery there is a csf space which is known as the prepontine system then uh, posterior to the fourth ventricle you will see the cerebellum and the cerebellum is composed of three parts the left hemisphere the right hemisphere and the cerebellar body which is known as the vermis and this is the vermis of the cerebellum left hemisphere and right hemisphere the same by mri t1 weighted image and t2 weighted image fourth ventricle cerebellar vermis left hemisphere right hemisphere bones basilar artery and the prepontine system what you can see here and you don't see in the ct scan is the trigeminal nerve which is one of the biggest cranial nerves that can be easily seen by mri going from the brain stem through the cistern around the brain stem then it, it goes through the skull base to reach its ganglion in the paracellular area in posterior to the cerebellum there is a csf space which is known as the cisterna magna the prepontine cistern this one has a left-sided extension at the, cere the cerebellopontine angle and a right-sided extension. This is known as cerebellopontine angle cistern or the ambient cistern. The junction between the cerebellum and the brain stem is known as the cerebellum. The junction between the bones and the cerebellum, this is the cerebellopontine junction. And you know that the cerebellum is connected to the brain stem through the cerebellar peduncles. The inferior one connects the medulla to the cerebellum. The middle one, which is the biggest one, connects the bones to the cerebellum. And the smaller one, the superior, connects the midbrain to the cerebellum. Then if you look here, and this is the connection between the bones and the cerebellum, and this is the middle cerebellar peduncle. Then if you go down, this is the fourth ventricle, which is large. If you go down, the fourth ventricle will be smaller. And at that time, you will see the medulla oblongata in front of the fourth ventricle. Then you will see the left hemisphere, the right hemisphere, and you don't see the vermis as below the vermis there is a very fine CSF space connecting the cisterna magna to the inferior part of the fourth ventricle which is known as the vellicula and this is the vellicula 
then this is the fourth ventricle which is small getting large getting large until you reach this level of the bronze and here by MRI you see the small fourth ventricle with the medulla oblongata anterior to it left hemisphere right hemisphere cisterna magna and then at this level the fourth ventricle is big and this is the bronze this is the middle cerebellar peduncle and this is left hemisphere right hemisphere and the cerebellar vermis then if you go more upward the fourth ventricle will be smaller then you are reaching the level of the midbrain and you will see the superior part of the cerebellum and this is the level of the superior vermis the inferior vermis is down and the superior vermis is above then you see the cerebellar folia and you see one of the important structures which is known as the quadrigeminal cistern along the back of the uh, brain stem then once more you see here the fourth ventricle which is small and this is the medulla oblongata cerebellar hemispheres and cerebellar vermes the fourth ventricle is big and this is the the bones and the basilar artery the prepontine cistern ambient cistern on both sides middle cerebellar peduncle left hemisphere right hemisphere then if you go up and you see the fourth ventricle is getting smaller and this is the brain stem the transition zone between the bones and the, the midbrain left hemisphere right hemisphere and the cerebellar vermis then if you reach this level which is the level of the quadrigeminal cistern the quadrigeminal cistern looks like a dish and in the middle of this dish and you can see a small uh, a structure filled by CSF and this is the end of the fourth ventricle and the start of the aqueduct of Sylvius which will connect the fourth ventricle to the third ventricle at the level of the quadrigeminal cistern you will see the midbrain and this is the midbrain as you appreciate in the uh, CT scan but in in the CT scan and MRI you got very important structures at this level which are the components of the medial part of the temporal lobe which are responsible for uh, the uh, the uh, epileptic fits if they are pathologically affected there are two main structures the amygdala or the amygdaloid nucleus and the hippocampus the amygdala is anterior structure and the hippocampus is posteriorly located and you may have the temporal horn of the uh, lateral ventricle as a reference to separate between the amygdala and the, the hippocampus this is the temporal horn of the ventricle the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle and uh, this is the site of the amygdala and this is the site of the hippocampus then you know that the limbic system is uh, the 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 part of the brain which regulates the emotions and memory and this limbic system is a very very complicated system the amygdaloid nucleus and the hippocampus are parts of this uh, uh, of this limbic system then if you look here and you can easily appreciate the site of the amygdaloid nucleus or the amygdala and the site of the hippocampus you remember this is the superior cerebellar cistern and this is the midbrain surrounded posteriorly by the quadrigeminal cistern and this is the site of the amygdala in the cor coronal images they are located anteriorly and the hippocampus is located somewhat posteriorly the hippocampus is formed of three parts the head the body and the tail and the, these colors represent the right one in red and left one in green the hippocampus anterior to the hippocampus is the site of the amygdala then this is the head of the uh, hippocampus and uh, going up you can you can uh, cut in the body until you reach the tail of the hippocampus which is located posterior to this cistern i will mention just a moment which is known as the choroidal fissure or the retrothalamic cistern 
then the hippocampus is seen in the coronal image related to the temporal horn of the ventricle this is the site of the hippocampus if this hippocampus is ischemic or atrophic and uh, then he, the patient may develop epileptic fits and the best way to evaluate this is, is the coronal MRI especially in the T2 and the flare images where you can appreciate the size of the hippocampus and also you can see the signal intensity of the hippocampus and here you, you can see that the left hippocampus is small and is of abnormal signal then if you look here and you see this is the right hippocampus and this is the left one if you compare both images and you see the left one this is the size of the hippocampus and the here on the right side the size is smaller the size on the left is bigger than that on the right in all images and you may feel that there is faint increase in the signal and this disease is known as mesial temporal sclerosis mesial means medial temporal means temporal sclerosis means gliosis then here the, the the disease may be bilateral and you remember that this is the site of the hippocampus in the flare images it shows increased signal bilaterally along the course of the hippocampus starting from the head to the body to the tail of the hippocampus then at this level when you reach the level of the midbrain and you can easily see the quadrigeminal cistern and this point in the midline represents the aqueduct of Sylvius, which connects the fourth to the third ventricles. Then in the uh, midbrain, and you can see what looks like a V-shaped cistern, which is known as the interpeduncular cistern, because this cistern is located between these two parts, which are the cerebral peduncles the cerebral peduncles you, you know that the cerebellum is connected to the brain stem by three cerebellar peduncles but there is only one cerebral peduncle which is located here and this is the interpeduncular cistern then at this level the interpeduncular cistern is connected to the supracellular cistern where the circle of willis is uh, anatomically located in this level you see the aqueduct of course you see the superior part of the cerebellum and you can also appreciate the quadrigeminal cistern then looking carefully at this and you see that number one refers to the aqueduct of Sylvius number two and five refers to the cerebral peduncle this is the right one and this is the left one number three refers to the hippocampus and anteriorly here you will see the amygdaloid nucleus very aqueductal gray matter and this is very important dealing with the uh, uh, white matter diseases and you got some gray matter around the aqueduct of Sylvius which is a normal finding then number six is the substantia nigra which is located uh, just posterior to the cerebral uh, peduncle. Then here you see the aqueduct of, uh, sorry, the quadrigeminal cistern and the midbrain is located in its concavity. And also by MRI you see the quadrigeminal cistern and the midbrain is located in its concavity and you appreciate the aqueduct of Sylvius and these are the cerebellar folia then what about the optic tracts the optic tracts are the you know the optic nerve will go to the supracellular area forming the chiasm then the, uh, the each one will go in the opposite direction forming the optic tract and this is the optic tracts these uh, structures i am uh, pointing to these are the optic tracts and the mammillary bodies are two very small structures that are located on either side of the midline within the interpeduncular cistern. These are the mammillary bodies.
and then the aqueductal sylvius this is the aqueduct and the superior vermis of course this is the superior vermis and here is a magnified view to appreciate the mammillary bodies the mammillary bodies are of almost equal size they are located on either side of the midline and uh, they are present within the in the interpeduncular cistern this is the cerebral peduncle and this is the substantia nigra and this is the the rest of the uh, midbrain then the mammillary bodies are part of the hypothalamus if you remember the lecture of the uh, supracellular pathology then they have a role in memory and they their exact role is actually is not yet established the mammillary bodies are rounded bared structures on either side of the midline they are separated by the intermammillary sulcus and the, this is the site of the intermammillary sulcus then once more in here you see the quadrigeminal cistern and this is the optic tract this is the mammillary bodies the intermammillary sulcus the interpeduncular cistern the cerebral peduncle on on either side then after you leave this level and you go up then you are cutting in the lateral ventricles the frontal horn and the occipital horn as well as you are cutting in the third ventricle at this level when whenever you see the frontal horn separate from the occipital horn and the third ventricle is present you know that you are in the basal ganglia level and at this level you can appreciate the caudate nucleus in the concavity of the frontal horn and this is the head of the caudate nucleus and the lentiform nucleus which is located here and the thalamus which is located on either side of the third ventricle then if you look to the ct scan and you see this very faint hyper density this is the codate and this is the lentiform and this is the thalamus then if you look here that this is very important structure which is the internal capsule passing between the codate the lentiform and the thalamus and this is also the internal capsule this is the head of the codate this is the lentiform and this is the thalamus then once more this is the level of the basal ganglia this area belongs to the head of the caudate nucleus and this area belongs to the lentiform nucleus and this area belongs to the left thalamus and the structure in between is the internal capsule and here you can appreciate the head of the caudate nucleus the lentiform nucleus and the thalamus on either side of the uh, third ventricle then the quadrigeminal cistern in the, the section below was uh, similar to a dish or a concave structure but at this level the quadrigeminal cistern is rhomboid in shape it is rhomboid in shape it has four corners left and right posterior and anterior the left one lies posterior to the thalamus and is known as retrothalamic cistern or uh, and maybe uh, in, in the literature called the choroidal fissure and the choroidal fissure if you look posterior to it and you can see the tail of the hippocampus then this cistern is above the cerebellum it is known as the superior cerebellar cistern and this is the choroidal fissure on the right side or the retrothalamic cistern on the right side the csf space which is going above the third ventricle is known as the velum interbositum and you know that this is the internal capsule then the quadrigeminal cistern is rhomboid in shape it contains four structures this calcified one is the, the pineal body and uh, posterior to it are two internal cerebral veins and also the vein of gallon the three calcified structures seen on the ct scan are the choroid plexus in the ventricle responsible for csf production and the pineal body two choroid plexus 
and the binaeal body. These are physiologic calcifications occur in every adult. Then if you go to this anatomy, the decodate nucleus is here, lentiform nucleus is there, the thalamus is here, the internal capsule in between, the quadrigeminal cistern, this rhomboid structure, the choroidal fissure, this one, the hippocampal tail posterior to it, the pineal body is this one, the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles. Then the CSF space going above the third ventricle is known as the velum interbosed. Whenever you go above the level of the basal ganglia, you are cutting in the body of the ventricle, and the bodies are separated from the midline by the septum velocidum, and you see the rest of the caudate nucleus. And uh, you remember in the level below, you see the head. The head of the caudate nucleus, like the hippocampus, is inferior, and the body and the tail are superior. And this is the body and the tail of the caudate nucleus along the wall of the lateral ventricle. Then in this area, you can see the white matter and the gray matter. The white matter in the CT and the T2 weighted images looks more dark, while the gray matter in the CT and T2 weighted images looks more bright. But in the T1 weighted image, the white matter is white and the gray matter is gray. Then going up, you will see the white and the gray matter of both cerebral hemispheres and they are separated by the interhemispheric fissure and the demarcation between the gray and the white matter is known as the gray-white matter interface. Then this anatomy have it changed a little bit uh, and uh, I intended to uh, present these changes uh, uh, I will demonstrate first what I was saying, then what is new. Previously, I said that in the posterior fossa, you see the fourth ventricle, the bones, the basal artery, the prepontine cistern, ambient cistern, ambient cistern. And this is the middle cerebellar peduncle, left hemisphere, vermis, and right hemisphere. This is part of the temporal lobe, and this is the frontal lobe, and uh, these facts have not changed. Then, and previously I said that if you want to locate the lobes of the brain and you draw two lines in relation to the ventricles, and the part of the brain anterior to the first line is the frontal lobe, and that is posterior to the second line is the occipital lobe and the, the area in between depends on the level if you are at the level of the third ventricle and this is the temporal lobe and if you are at the body of the ventricle then of the lateral ventricle and this is the parietal lobe of course and the the the, the last issue here is if you are cutting above the ventricles and you divide the, the slice into four parts the anterior part belongs to the frontal lobe and the, the remaining three parts belong to the parietal lobe and this is wrong then uh, i said also if you are cutting high up in the brain you are cutting in the parietal lobe and this is wrong also what is uh, uh, the new uh, way to demonstrate the anatomy and here you can you can look to the frontal lobe in different animals like the cat or the dog and uh, sometimes of the monkeys and in the human in the human being you see that the frontal lobe is very big and this is reasonable then if you are cutting high up in the brain actually you will cut the frontal lobe not the parietal lobe and uh, this uh, anatomic demonstration is uh, uh, is taken from this very uh, good site uh, on the internet for anatomy and it demonstrates clearly the the precise site of the lower anatomy of the brain 
and in the posterior fossa there is no difference you see the cerebellar hemisphere and you see part of the brain stem inferiorly you are cutting in the medulla oblongata then in the bones then in the midbrain but if you go above the 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 tentorium you remember that uh, 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 in the posterior fossa if uh, the section hits the cerebellum and the occipital lobe you will see part of the occipital lobe posterior to the cerebellum and you cannot differentiate both easily by ct but you can easily differentiate them by mri then if you go above the tentorium this is the temporal lobe and this is okay and this is part of the occipital lobe in the parasagittal area this is the occipital lobe and at this level you got a big part of the temporal lobe and a smaller part of the occipital lobe and here starting a part of the frontal lobe then if you go up you are cutting here in the basal ganglia level and you see the salamus the lentiform and the caudate nuclei and this is the frontal lobe it's okay and uh, this is the temporal lobe and you see here and this is the occipital lobe and if you go up the occipital lobe will be smaller and also the temporal lobe will be smaller and you are starting to cut in the parietal lobe then the temporal the occipital lobe is not seen beyond this this level and actually above in the whenever you are cutting in the bodies of the ventricles there is no occipital lobe in this particular area then if you go up to the ventricles the section is made only of the frontal and parietal lobes only and then whenever you are going up 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 then you are left with the frontal lobe not the parietal lobe as i have mentioned before and the parietal lobe getting gets smaller until it is not seen in the highest level of the brain sections and you remember that i have mentioned that the uh, uh, fibers through the spinal cord come to bus through the internal capsule and they radiate after the internal capsule into the corona uh, radiata this is the level of the internal capsule and this is the bones and this is the corona radiata then the vascular anatomy uh, by ct is now easy after the development of ct angiography and you see here this is the site of the internal carotid artery the middle cerebral artery goes outward and the anterior cerebral artery goes towards the midline until uh, uh, both are connected together through the anterior communicating artery posteriorly the basilar artery will give rise to the uh, posterior cerebral uh, on either side and the posterior cerebral is connected to the internal carotid through the posterior communicating communicating artery and this is the circle of wheels then what are the values of the sagittal images which are considered an essential part of the protocol number one is the anatomic localization of the lobes in the sagittal images it is easy to see the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the cerebellum, the bones, the, the medulla, the bones in the midbrain, and also to appreciate the corpus callosum, which is not seen in the axial images. Not appreciated in the axial images. Then anatomic localization, demonstration of the corpus callosum, assessment of the cranio-cervical junction, and this is one of the of the important roles for the sagittal images, and also one of the uh, essential imaging uh, planes for evaluation of the pituitary gland. In the in the uh, pre-contrast scans, you can in the sagittal images separate the anterior pituitary from the posterior pituitary also in cases of uh, venous sinus thrombosis the sagittal image is one of the best views to see the uh, the venous sinuses you know that uh, the sagittal images start from the left side then passing by the midline then going to the right side then if you have the full series and you know that this this is the frontal horn and here you can see the temporal horn the lobe the frontal lobe the temporal lobe the parietal lobe the occipital lobe 
but in the midline image you cannot see the temporal lobe of course but you can see part of the frontal lobe the parietal lobe the occipital lobe the cerebellum and the brain stem then if you are cutting exactly in the midline you should not see brain tissue but you see csf within the interhemispheric fissure but in most of the cases we are not cutting exactly in the midline with this level maybe a little bit towards the left or a little bit towards the right side then you can see the brain parenchyma but if you cut exactly in the midline you will not see brain tissue but you will see csf the coronal images are not part of the protocol but they are essential whenever you are assessing a case of uh, scissors or epilepsy to evaluate the hippocampal area also it is important very important in evaluation of the pituitary gland and the cavernous sinuses the chiasm in the hypothalamic area and also assessment of the skull base if there uh, if there is a lesion coming from the nasopharynx, for example, uh, destroying the skull base, getting in tracranially, then you can appreciate easily in the coronal images. The trigeminal nerve is, is uh, best seen in the axial images, but in the coronal images, you can see it on either side of the uh, brain stem. The vascular anatomy also is better appreciated in the coronal images. This is the internal carotid, and this is the middle cerebral, and this is the anterior cerebral. This is the appearance of the hippocampus in the coronal images. And the, this is T2 and uh, T1. And here, he, the site of the hippocampus, and you compare both sides together. And uh, of course, if there is some patient tilt, you've got asymmetry, and be careful about this. MR of the vascular anatomy, uh, the vessels can be seen as black tubular structures in MR images because of the signal void phenomena. And this is the middle, the an internal carotid, middle cerebral, anterior cerebral artery. And um, of course, you can have this MR angiography without the need to inject contrast material and you see the internal carotid, middle cerebral, and anterior cerebral artery. And this is the previously used technique, which is the conventional angiography using the digital subtraction techniques. And this is MR angiography of the circle of Willis, showing the internal carotid artery, the middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and these are the posterior cerebral arteries. Then we came to the venous anatomy, and you know we have the biggest uh, venous sinus which is the superior sagittal sinus best appreciated in the sagittal image as you see and a smaller uh, one which is the inferior sagittal uh, sinus which is a little bit uh, uh, inferior to it then you got the uh, the uh, the straight sinus and this is the straight sinus which is uh, uh, draining also the vein of gallin and the internal cerebral veins and you go through the straight sinus to the confluence of the sinuses and then you go to the transverse sinus then the sigmoid then the internal jugular vein then once more and you see the superior sagittal sinus the inferior sagittal sinus the site of the vein of gallin and the straight sinus the confluence of the sinuses the transverse sinus the sigmoid and the internal jugular vein and this is a sagittal image of mr venography of the uh, brain then you see the superior sagittal sinus and um, this is the uh, vein of gallin and uh, this is the inferior sagittal sinus and here is the straight sinus and this is the confluence of the sinuses this is the transverse sinus and this is the sigmoid sinus and here the internal jugular vein on the axial image you see the confluence of the sinuses the transverse the sigmoid and the internal jugular vein and this is the transverse sinus the confluence of the sinuses and this is the straight of course the straight sinus and the uh, the uh, internal jugular vein and here you can appreciate the site of the uh, sigmoid sinus 
and the internal jugular vein, transverse sinus, the confluence of the sinuses, and the superior sagittal sinus. This is the internal jugular, sigmoid, and transverse, and confluence of the sinuses. And here you can see the uh, superior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the transverse sinus, and the uh, sigmoid sinus, and the internal jugular vein. Thank you very much.